Coming up on Doctype, it's part two of our two-part series on CSS positioning. We're gonna clear up some of the confusion about the float property. Then, we're gonna teach you how iterators work in JavaScript so that you don't get thrown for a loop. So get out your tray table and put your seat in the full relaxed position because it's time for Doctype. Today's episode of Doctype is brought to you by LessComp and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that doesn't know the difference between JavaScript and a decaf latte. Or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding. Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Okay, so last week we got a viewer question from Elliot. Elliot writes, what about discussing a little about CSS positioning? For example, when to use floats for positioning versus when to use relative or absolute positioning for positioning. Well, last week we discussed fixed, relative, and absolute positioning, and this week we're gonna finish things up by talking about floats. Let's check it out. Years ago when designers were transitioning from table-based layouts to CSS-based layouts, the float property became really important. Floats allow text and other content to flow around elements. The float property accepts four values, left, right, none, and inherit. By default, float is set to none on all elements, and the most commonly used values are left and right. Let's say you had a div and you wanted to have some other paragraph text flow around it, like in a magazine. In your markup, you would first place the div and then place the paragraph text after it. The div shouldn't go inside the paragraph. Next you would need to apply an explicit width to your floated element so that it doesn't just span across its container. Finally, you should apply the float property to the div and set the value to left. This will send the div over to the left of the container and the text will appear to flow around it. It's a good idea to add some padding as well because for the sake of readability, you almost never want text to run right up against another element. Nearly every modern CSS framework creates columns using floats. Here's how you can create some simple columns on your own. Creating columns is simpler than you might think. To create columns, you'll need at least three divs. The first div will act as a container, and the second two divs will go inside the container. For our purposes, we'll name the two child divs column one and column two. We'll set an explicit width on each one of the columns and then tell the columns to float to the left. We can also create some gutter between the columns by adding some margin to the right side. If you want your columns to fill the entire width of the page, you'll need to do your math carefully. If the width, margin, padding, and borders on the columns all combine to a pixel value that is wider than the parent container, the columns will appear to stack rather than appearing side by side one another. Finally, if you intentionally want an element to appear below a floated element, like in the case of a footer for example, apply the clear property to it and set its value to both. Now, you may have noticed that floats don't quite always behave like you'd expect. In particular, the parent div might appear to be collapsed. Fortunately, there's a couple ways to fix this. The best and easiest way to fix a collapsed parent is to apply the overflow property and set the value to auto or hidden. This is the best fix in an ideal world, but unfortunately, this fix isn't always possible in practice, as it does not work in Internet Explorer 6. Another method is to float the parent element. This will allow it to expand to fit the child elements, but again, this isn't always possible in practice because it might have undesirable effects on your layout. If the first two methods don't work for your layout, there is one more outdated method that you can try, and that is to add extra markup. This method is most often implemented by adding a div at the bottom of the container and setting its clear property to both. This isn't recommended though because it adds non-semantic markup, but it can solve the problem quickly and easily if nothing else seems to work. Now when we come back, Jim is going to teach us about iterators in JavaScript, but first, let's take a look at a conference from the future.
In JavaScript, there are different ways to loop through the members of an object or the values of an array. We're going to take a look at three of them and the differences between them. When working with arrays, you can use a for loop to iterate through each element of the array. If you're familiar with C or a similar language, this should look familiar to you. We use the for keyword, and in parentheses we put three statements, separated by semicolons. In the first statement, we declare a variable that will hold the current iteration number throughout our loop. We call this i. You can use any name for this variable, but typically it's i, or if i is being used, j or k and so on. The next statement is a stop condition. When this condition evaluates to true, the loop will terminate. In this case, we want to make sure our i variable is less than the length of our array. Remember, array indices start at zero, so if we have three elements in our array, the last element will be at index two. The final statement is executed after each iteration of the loop. Here we increment i by using the plus plus operator. Inside of our loop, we can get the item at our current position by calling myArray sub i. We can then do whatever we want with that element of our array. If we want to get each property of a JavaScript object, we can use a different form of the for loop, the for in loop. Here, we first declare a variable called key. In each iteration of our loop, key will hold the string name of one of the properties of our object. We again use the keyword for, but this time we say key in person. This means we're going to take each property of person and assign that name to key. Then inside the loop, we can assign the value by using person sub key. If there are any properties defined on the prototype, they will also be iterated over. But sometimes you just want the properties of the object itself and not its prototype. In this example, each person has a name and age, but there's also species defined on the prototype. If we only wanted to loop over name and age, we can check that the person has that property by using object has own property. If it returns true, then that key is defined on the object itself and not its prototype. In newer versions of JavaScript, there is a for each method defined on array. Now some JavaScript libraries create this for you to create backwards compatibility, and you can easily implement it yourself. Here we call the for each method directly on the array and pass it a function. The function will be called for each value in the array, with the first argument being the value and the second argument being the iteration number. This can be a convenient way to loop through the array, but be aware that since it's using an inner function, if you wanted to return from your function from within the loop, you cannot because that return will be scoped to the inner function. These are just some common ways to iterate over objects and arrays in JavaScript. Most JavaScript frameworks provide their own utilities for iterating as well, so be sure to check the documentation. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you going to go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you going to use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so why not so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype